the gospel recorded by St. Matthew. As it was read this morning. In the 18th chapter. And the 6th verse. Gospel of St. Matthew. The 18th chapter and the sixth verse. But whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones to believe in me, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. But whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The title of the sermon this morning is, What Could Be Worse? What Could Be Worse? Today we're celebrating Children's Day, and I had hoped that we would have had one of the young people to be the speaker this morning, but instead you're stuck with an old man. <laughs> well, I'll tell you about being old in a moment. Because this is Children's Day, I'm going to deviate slightly from my emphasis on the spirit and focus on children. Although the majority of the sermon is directed toward adults, I will say something to the children at the end. In the late 19th century, we began to create for the average family something that until then was only the privilege of the wealthy. A thing, that thing is childhood. Until the late 19th century, poor and working families needed children to work. Children worked for two primary reasons. First, to bring income to the family, and then second, they were more efficient than, than adults. This is especially true in industrial cities where I'm from. In cities that had industrial factories, children's hands are smaller and could work in narrower spaces in machines that adult hands were too big for. Think about the garment industry in New York, where a child's hands were small enough to maneuver around those sewing machines where an adult's hand was too big. Here in the South, children wore extra hands on the farm. They helped to share the work of the farm. Help was needed such that school systems organized the school year around times of planting and harvest mm -hmm. so that children could be out of school. But at the beginning of, beginning in the 19th century, unions began to organize and they worked to get laws passed restricting the labor of children. <laughs> Laws were passed placing age requirements on when children could begin to work and how many hours a child could work each week. Children's work was restricted in factories and states began mandating set number of days wherein a child needed to be in school. With these types of laws being passed, over time we began to shift our understanding and belief about children from that of a source of labor to the concept of children needing to be protected and developed. This is when there was a strong push for public education. Now we understand that this push for public education didn't involve us. Yet, <clears throat> public education was stressed as a way of developing and educating children. And they needed to be exposed to as rounded a curriculum as possible. Mm -hmm. 
Children needed to play because play helped to develop their imaginations and creativity. And out of all of that, by the middle of the 20th century, we had something that we had never had before. It was called childhood. And while we have spent more than a century developing childhood, the concept and belief of childhood did not exist in biblical days. In Jesus' day, a child was at the bottom of the social strata just one step above a slave. Children had no rights. They were the sole property of their fathers. A child was the property of the father and simply did without question whatever the father said the child should do. If the child was a male, he would work alongside of his father to learn his father's trade. If the child was a female, then she received no schooling at all. She just waited until she grew up to about the age of 12 so that she could be married off. This is how children were thought of in biblical days. So imagine the shock that must have come over the disciples when Jesus took a child into his arms. A child who had no rights. A child whose status was just that of a slave. A child who was at the bottom of the society. Jesus took a child and said to those adult men, that they had to become like children to enter the kingdom of God. That had to be shocking to them. They were arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. And the disciples expected Jesus to respond saying something about them. Clearly, they had discussed this amongst themselves and they had gone to Jesus to settle the question. Peter was the leader, so I'm sure he believed that he would be the greatest. But Luke tells us in his gospel that the dispute was among James and John, the sons of Zebedee. But in either case, when the disciples came to Jesus, they expected Jesus to settle the question by pointing to one of them. Imagine their shock when instead of speaking and lauding one of them, Jesus instead called a child over to stand with them and said, unless you are converted and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Disciples had to have been shocked. Child, the lowest in society, and we have to become like a child. When Jesus told the disciples that they needed to become like children, he was trying to teach them humility and what it takes to be a servant. They were arguing over who would be the greatest, but in chapter 23, Jesus tells them that the greatest among them would be a servant. So in saying that they needed to become like children, he was telling them that the greatness in the kingdom comes not from the highest position, but from the lowest. To be great in the kingdom, you can't aspire to the highest place and the greatest position. You need to humble yourself and to seek the lowest position. I'm sure this was a difficult lesson for the disciples to learn. But it's the same lesson that we must learn today. Jesus wasn't only teaching about humility, he was also teaching us to value children. And he was teaching us how much children are valued in the kingdom. Now children are very intelligent, but they lack perspective. They have no sense of history 
They have no sense of the world that existed before them. My son, David, he was about 14, and he wanted me to take him to a movie that starred Adam Sandler and Chris Rock. And I refused to take him to any movie that starred Chris Rock. Now, he swore to me that the movie didn't have all of the cussing and stuff that Chris Rock was known for, and I said, now, what do you know about that? But he was persistent. He just wanted me to take him to this movie. The movie was The Longest Yard, and I finally told him that I would not take him to that movie, and besides, I had already seen it. He said, huh? I said, yeah, I, I saw that movie 30 years ago. He said, how, how could you see a movie? It just come out. I said, David, this is a remake of an old movie. It's a movie about a football game between the prisoners and the guards. And it starred Burt Reynolds. And he said, who's that? <laughs> but David, even though he was 14, hadn't developed a perspective to understand that there was a whole world that had gone on before him. Last week, Micah taught me how to play Go Fish. <laughs> this is a new game for her, and because it's a new game for her, well, her father obviously doesn't know anything about it, so she had to teach me how to play Go Fish. <laughs> See, according to Micah, I'm old. <laughs> now, don't laugh yet, all right? Here's why she believes I'm old. She says I was born way back in the 1990s, or the 1900s. And, and she emphasized the way back part. She said, Daddy, what did you do way back then? What was life like? I tried to explain to her, we didn't do anything then and we don't do now. You, know, you grow up, you go to school. I said, I had your brother way back then. But she doesn't understand what life could be like way back in the 1900s. She hasn't yet developed a perspective of history. Children are dependent and trusted. And because they're so trusting, we can tell them anything, and we do. I remember as a child some of the things that my grandmother would tell me. I remember when I would come home from school with something I learned and would tell it to her, she'd say, yeah, I know that. And I'd ask, how did you know this? She, she used to tell me, well, I went to school for a week. <laughs> And then I'd be trying to figure out how she learned so much having only gone to school for a week. And because they're trusting, we tell them anything. Now I'm going to be careful here, but you know that thing we tell children at the end of the year? You know during that last month, that thing we like to tell children? And some of the things we tell them at the end of the year get really amazing, aren't they? Micah is at that stage where she doesn't like kisses, but that doesn't stop me. <laughs> and I tell her that I'm, I have to kiss her because it's required in the Father's handbook. <laughs> She told her mother that I said that and she came back next week and said, Mommy says that there's no such thing as a father's handbook. And I said, well, how would she know? She's not a father. <laughs> Micah thought about that for a moment. And then she didn't say anything else. But because children are so dependent upon us and are so trusty, yes, we tell them a lot of things. But it is important that we are careful in what we tell them and in what we do 
because we are held responsible if we lead them astray. This is the value that children have in the kingdom. Sure, they're going to grow up and inevitably they are going to learn and do things that are not good for them. And because they learn things that are not good for them, they will also learn to sin. That's going to happen. But children are so valuable in the kingdom that the person who leads them to sin is held directly responsible. Listen to what Jesus says in our text in verses 6 and 7. But whoever causes the downfall of one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Yes, the world will bring offense on its own. Children will grow up and learn things that are not good for them. But Jesus says, woe to the one who teaches a child or causes a child to fall into sin. Jesus says, for that person, the person who causes a child to fall into sin, it would be better for him if they had a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. In those days, you had to grind your wheat to make flour for bread. And to do that, you used a mill which consisted of two large stones. You would pour your grain onto the bottom stone, and then the top stone would be lowered down upon it, and it would turn in order to grind the grain. But in order to turn that stone, you needed a donkey or a mule. That's how heavy it was. Sometimes you needed two mules to turn that stone. That's how heavy it is. And imagine something that heavy. And Jesus saying, it's better to tie that around your neck. Mm -hmm and drown yourself in the sea rather than lead one of my little ones into sin. My God, if it's better for me to tie a millstone around my neck, what could possibly be worse? Jesus doesn't even begin to tell us what our punishment would be for leading one of his children astray. He just tells us what's better than that. What's better than leading his children astray is tying a millstone around our neck. And if that's better, what could possibly be worse? Jesus doesn't tell us I'm not sure I really want to know. <laughs> now, on one hand, I'm not trying to scare you, but on the other hand, I am. There should be a certain fear about the way we guide and lead children because as servants of God, we should never be the ones that lead them astray. I'm not so naive to think that this never happens. But what I'm saying is that it should never happen. As servants of God, we should never be the ones that leads a child astray. Amen. We should be examples for children of what it is to serve God, not examples of what it is to dishonor God. thinking of a child right now who won't come to church because of something that child saw in church. Mm -hmm. How terrible that is. Mm -hmm. And the person who caused that child to stumble, Jesus says, it is better 
for you to tie a heavy millstone around your neck and drown yourself in the depths of the sea. David scared me terribly once. I had a meeting in Chicago and I took him with me. And in Chicago, their subway system is above ground. They're, they're known as elevated trains. We call them the L for short. We took the L down to Chinatown for dinner. When it got to the stop, we couldn't get off the train for people trying to rush on. And when we finally pushed ourselves off and the train had gone on to the next station, I, I said to David, you know, it doesn't take much to just step aside and let people off before you get on. David said, I know. <laughs> How do you know that? Dad, I've been watching you. <laughs> well, I'm glad that he watched me. And I'm glad he watched me doing something good. But it scared me to think of what he often watched me do. Children watch everything that you do. Has he seen me doing something I shouldn't be doing? Has he heard me say something I shouldn't have said? What has he seen me doing when I didn't know he was around? I hate to think of what he could have seen. Maybe I need to repent for something that I didn't know about. I'd hate for my having to tie a millstone around my neck because of something I've led David to see. Raising children is a wonderful and beautiful thing. But as Christians, should be a scary thing when we realize how much God values children. God places such value upon the children that God holds us directly responsible for them. And nothing could be worse than leading one of God's children astray better that you tie a millstone around your neck and drown yourself in the sea than to lead one of God's little ones astray. And that is better. What could possibly be worse? To the children, I want to remind you of this, that your value by God. You are valued by God more than anything else. Now I know, you know we want to grow up and be adults as fast as we can. But the Bible doesn't say that adults are as valued as children are. Amen. They're valued because they're precious in God's sight. And God takes great interest and care in children which is why Jesus pulled a child to him and said that you must be a child to enter the kingdom of God. Children are precious to God. They're precious to us. And we should be careful about how we live before them.